So Micah Fisher and Paul Hersoon were really some of the first uh, to suggest that patients with systemic sclerosis, once they develop pulmonary hypertension, have worse outcomes than other forms of pulmonary hypertension, in particular idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. In this early study, the median survival after diagnosis was only about three years. Thankfully, this has improved a little bit over the next couple decades, but it's still not uh, as strong or not as good as to other forms of pulmonary hypertension. And so there's really two possible hypotheses for these observations. First of all, these individuals might have a heart problem. That is, perhaps they have intrinsic right ventricular uh, dysfunction, myocyte injury from fibrosis, inflammation, or small vessel ischemia or they actually have a lung problem, or more specifically, a lung vessel problem, uh, and perhaps pulmonary vascular resistance, the most commonly we, common way we estimate afterload in the cath lab, may not accurately reflect the total afterload imposed on the right ventricle, and perhaps there's an increase of what we're gonna call pulsatile loading due to stiffening of the proximal pulmonary arteries. So we looked at over 1,000 patients with either known or suspected pulmonary hypertension, all of which had normal left atrial pressure, and we found this same inverse hyperbolic predictable relationship between resistance compliance in the lung. You can see this is very different from the systemic circulation, which is now shown here, and this is really best highlighted when we plot the RC times of the two circulations versus either the mean pulmonary artery pressure or the mean systemic pressure. The open dots here is the pulmonary vasculature, and you can see that RC time is really highly constrained, around 0.5 seconds, where in the systemic circulation, it's much more varied. And again, why is that? It's because we can change compliance without altering resistance in the systemic circulation, where they're very, very tightly connected and dependent on one another in the, in the pulmonary circulation. But I think what's less appreciated is that the RV remains afterload sensitive even in, a chronic, in the chronic setting. So this is one of my favorite, very simple hemodynamic experiment, experiments done by Anna, Numinous, Anna Hemnes and John Newman at Vanderbilt. They measured hemodynamics before and after administration of inhaled nitric oxide in patients with vasoreactive pulmonary arterial hypertension. So by definition, these individuals had a significant decline in pulmonary pressures and pulmonary vascular resistance and then this was met by a significant increase in RV stroke volume. So this really reminds us that RV function in particular is determined by coupling of RV contractility, the intrinsic ability of the RV myocytes to stiffen, and the afterload imposed on it from the pulmonary circulation. It also means that a lot of our clinically used measures to assess RV function, like stroke volume, RV ejection fraction, fractional area change, and TAPSI, are low dependent and they may not give us a good sense of the intrinsic uh, function of the right ventricle. So let me summarize again what I've, I've, I've told you so far. The proximal vessels uh, account for very little uh, of the overall compliance of the pulmonary circulation and afterload. Systemic sclerosis related pulmonary hypertension patients have intrinsic RV dysfunction both globally and at the myocyte level and an inability to compensate for increases in load. And finally, while pressure volume assessment is the gold standard and predicts prognosis in pulmonary hypertension, it's probably not feasible for clinical practice. When we looked at our measures of contractility afterload and coupling, what we found is the patients with idiopathic uh, during submaximal early exercise could increase contractility, where the patients with scleroderma had no reserve. Contractility did not change at all. Afterload increased similar in both groups and therefore coupling improved slightly in the patients with idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, but actually fell in the patients with systemic sclerosis. But that's not the most uh, intriguing finding here. The most intriguing finding is what happened to the patients with scleroderma when they exercised, and that is their RV began to dilate. You can see here that the uh, in systolic and in diastolic volume of the patients with scleroderma increased significantly. And even though stroke volume was no difference between the two groups, because the RV dilated, that RV ejection fraction actually fell significantly during exercise in the patients with scleroderma. So we wondered, could we leverage this observation then to come up with a surrogate for RVPA coupling? And indeed, we found a pretty good relationship between exercise RV ejection fraction and resting RVPA coupling. And when we looked at these different parameters to predict resting uh, uncoupling, it was only exercise RV ejection fraction that was predicted. Resting RV ejection fraction was not predictive. 
cardiac output, PVR, NT pro BNP, none of our usual clinical measures predicted RVPA uncoupling. But can we leverage what we just discussed in reserve to perhaps give us a little bit more information about the state of the RV prior to LVAD? Now you might say, well, that's problematic, right? Because the most common way we assess reserve is by exercise or dibutamine. These patients really can't exercise and a lot of them are already on dibutamine, so how can we do that? And I would suggest that perhaps we could define a bit reserve a bit differently in this population. That is, we can look at the response of the RV to LV unloading, either with pharmacologic vasodilators like nitroprusside, or perhaps even temporary mechanical support to try to reproduce what's going to happen after that durable VAD placement. So to summarize, uh, RV reserve has prognostic and diagnostic value in HEF-REF, HEF-PEF, and pulmonary arterial hypertension. It may also predict resting RVPA coupling and may be useful uh, to predict right heart failure after VAD. How best to assess it and how to use it clinically uh, requires further study, and that's what we're working on now, trying to develop an RV stress test when you have a patient you think uh, may have hidden right ventricular dysfunction uh, or you're concerned about.